packed show for you this evening. We'll be taking a look back at Saturday's win over Stoke City and hearing from the two goal scorers, David McGoldrick and Lee Mousset. And we'll also get the pre-match thoughts of Jaden Bogle and the manager, Slavisha Jakanovic. The game is available to all Blades fans wherever you are. All you need to do is go to the website, sufc.co. Good to have you with us yet again. We are coming to you live from our studio here at Bramall Lane. As you can see, the lights are shining brightly as we build up to the Blades against Millwall. And part of our coverage, as ever, is the former Blades defender, Kevin Gage. Good evening. Good evening. Extra spring in your step after Saturday? Definitely. Three points is always very welcome. And the, and the way we played was superb as well. So, yeah, excellent. And also with us tonight is the former Sheffield United striker, Carlos Saba, who I know was watching from the stands at the weekend with your son. I saw him eating his hot dog that looked bigger than he was. Are you confident, Carl, that this could be the start of a winning run now? Yeah, um, I'm really excited. I'm, I'm enjoying the way we're playing and the boys are playing with belief and creating chances. So I've been really looking forward to this one. Right, the important thing is the team news is in. Let's take a look at that. There are two changes from the weekend. Now, Conor Harahan is in, as is David McGoldrick after his cameo from the bench. Norwood and Njai drop to the bench. Carl, let's get your thoughts on the team news there. Well, it's uh, really positive. Obviously, the performance that um, Didzy put in has earned him his place, and that's what we've been, we've been hoping for. We've been hoping that people would affect the match and grab a place in the starting eleven. And Hurahan, these set pieces have been excellent. And it's nice, he, he must be up to speed now with his fitness and the manager sees, sees that he, he's a good option to start. Very exciting lineup. McGoldrick in from the start. We know what he can offer. At a full tilt, Dave McGoldrick can make a big difference to this team, can't he, Kevin? Absolutely. He's a top quality player, isn't he? It's a little bit harsher than Jay, but I hope he takes it the right way because he's, he's done so well in, the, in, his, <laughs> in his time he's, he's been in for the last two months. And it's... And I hope he bounces back from it. But sometimes as a young player, just to step away and watch the team will be good for him. But yeah, it's not, it's not a downgrade at all, is it? it Even with Hurahan coming in. It's not a form thing with him, is it? Is it purely about the amount of games a young lad that's been thrust into the first team and suddenly been asked to learn on the job, as it were? Is it, is it purely about just taking him out and letting, letting him have a breather? I think, I think that generally is, is the reason. Now, obviously, McGoldrick's come on and... and performed brilliantly on Saturday so he's deserved a chance but yeah and Jai just just needs to take stock of what he's achieved in the last 10 weeks or so you know and on, on the first half on Saturday he was superb mm. his trickery and his creativity in that first half very close to getting a couple of goals himself. Carl Mousse on the bench he made a difference when he came on but it's clear isn't it he's had his injury problems he's had his fitness issues he's still trying to get somewhere like the least moose say that we all got to know at mm. certain points in the Premier League. I know, I think we're all really excited to see him back. It was great, his, his dynamic, dynamicism when he came on, he was everywhere, he was causing problems. We just want him to stay fit because it, he could be the difference this season. If he's playing well, he's going to, you know, he's going to cause so many problems. So it's great to see. Hope he gets on this afternoon, this evening and, and gets a few chances. Mm. What do you think was the biggest takeaway from the weekend, Kevin, apart from the three points, obviously? Mm. I think it's the manner in which we achieved it because it, it could easily have just filtered out into oh we've been unlucky again we've played really well but we haven't got anything for it which I think was the case at, at Middlesbrough and certainly against Bournemouth so I must admit even during the commentary I was losing a bit of faith second half because I couldn't see you know us getting a goal we were playing great and just not creating anything and, and Stoke were a very very good side by the way so I think the, the, the one takeaway to answer your question would be the, the way we achieved that result and we ground it out and, and from looking dead and buried kind of thing we've come back and won a really important uh, huge three points there. Yeah, I think it was the first time United had come from behind in a league game to win since West Brom in the Premier League in February. Wow. Being busy today. Uh, but <laughs> was, it, was it a statement win as well, Carl? No disrespect to the teams that Sheffield United had beaten previously, but the calibre of the opposition, Stoke had been having a terrific season up until the weekend. Does that send a bit of a message out? Does yeah. that add that extra bit of confidence into that dressing room? Well, yeah, and I think the confidence will have been there after Bournemouth match. You know, I went to Bournemouth and I couldn't, I couldn't believe how much better than them we were. I was, you know, I came away so disappointed and couldn't believe we lost. But 
we played against a, a very good Stoke team who will beat many teams in this division and, and we outplayed them. We were far better than them. Um, and the boys must be so confident and the fans will have gained confidence that, okay, we can go behind and we're not, it's not just going to frizzle out. We can support them, we, we can get behind them, we can cheer them because they're not going to stop to the final whistle. And I think it was a big match for the fans and for the players alike on Saturday. Well, let's see what we get tonight. Of course, United looking to make it back-to-back -back wins after that win over the Potters at the weekend as two subs arrived right on cue to clinch the three points. Stoke in their green shirts, black shorts and green socks. Nick Powell there getting this match underway. It's a deep corner and that's Brown with the header off the line. Still not alive. Goodness me. That was a very important clearance. I think it might have been Billy Sharp who got back there for United. Egan goes to the near post. Looking for Davis who gets something on it. Acrobatic effort from Gibbs White. Opportunity there, that was a lovely pass and time and drills a low cross into the penalty area. It's gone all the way across for Smith who connects first time. Stevens, that's a good looking ball now for Billy Sharp. Sharp with a deep cross in the back post. That was a chance, probably Sheffield United's best chance. It's that man Morgan Gibbs White once again. And maybe Stokes turn to attack. Ray Jeff, a decent save from Robin Olsen. Rancic with a follow up. United building a little bit of momentum towards the end of this first half. Gibbs White with a turn, Osborne wants it, Osborne with a cross, on, oh, like Bogle struck it against Njaye there. And it goes, Gibbs White was half a yard free at the near post there, couldn't quite climb tall enough, now Norwood to deliver, looking for Billy Sharp, oh. what a chance and a decent save from Adam Davis, best chance of the game so far. Gibbs White. Looking for Njaye, can he wriggle clear? Njaye with a strike and another save, this time to his right-hand side from Davis. Great spell this for Sheffield United. And Stevens joins the attack for Sheffield United. Final minute of the first half. Stevens gets the cross away oh. and it's a half chance again. Illumin and Njaye think going to be a corner. Bogle for the Blades. Sharp is wide, return ball towards Bogle's a really good one. Oh. Bogle's going to get there. Bogle oh. across the penalty area somehow, he's kept out. Still alive for Sheffield United. Stevens! Just wide of the far post. Now the space for Stoke all of a sudden. Brown back to goal. He managed to turn. Brown gets the shot away. That's a wonderful goal from Jacob Brown. He only needed half a yard. Struck it low beyond Robin Olsen. Delight for the former Barnsley man. 55 on the clock. It's Blaze nil. Stoke City 1. Stoke though that were on the attack again. And time it just bounces off a couple of challenges. Sawyers. All of a sudden, there's pockets of space, and there's a strike from Powell. That's me. Olsen diving to his right hand side. Nice combination between Sharp and McGold. McGold has got Moussa! Release Moussa off the bench, and he equalises for Sheffield United. The build up play from McGoldrick and Sharp was first class. The finish by Moussa into the top corner. 79 minutes on the clock. Blades 1, Stoke City 1. Hour and a half. Yellow boots bring Stevens into play. A lot more verve about this attack now for Sheffield United. Stevens across. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> David McGoldrick, how this game has turned on its head. Low cross from Stevens, finished by McGoldrick. What a turnaround for Sheffield United. 82 and a half minutes gone. Lays two, Stoke one. It is about back in that performance up now that's only a good win isn't it if they get a positive result here tonight Carl. yeah they've got to they've got to make it a platform now and build on this and, and take it forward and set that as like a benchmark because if you can create that many chances against a great stoke team and what what didn't translate in that was the referee and the assistant referee were not very good on Saturday and the players have overcame that they didn't let it affect their performances it was a hostile atmosphere but they focused and they went behind and they came through and that, that amount of chances against the Stoke team it could have been four or five yeah. goals easily the manager did say something in his post-match analysis and I quote there are times we don't trust ourselves and I was trying to figure out exactly what he meant by that now I'm trying to speak for him here, but is he, is he talking about maybe a lack of belief in key moments? We saw lots of chances in that game. You know, the, 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 the times when it really matters.
could it be that that he's referencing there, Kevin? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it might be a lost in translation somewhat, Possibly. mightn't it? Yeah. But um, I, th I think he just means, you know, players have got to believe in themselves and, and trust in their own ability. Because me, me and Carl were talking earlier, you know, man for man in this division, yeah, we've got the ability in this side. So they need to go out there and, and prove that week in, week out. And to be fair, I think they have been doing that mm. for, you know, since the early days of the season. We, we seem to be outperforming every side we come up against. It's just a question of getting the end results and, and getting the rewards you know, that our players deserved. And the bench is strong. It's up there with, with anybody's really in this division. As proven at the weekend, he's able to bring Moussa and McGoldrick on. Brewster's not even in the squad, not in the squad again tonight. But it shows the hungers there, doesn't it? And he will want to see that from his substitutes, especially the forward areas. He wants to see players like McGoldrick and Moussa, who've had to be patient as soon as they get on to do something and do yep. something they did. Absolutely. I mean, that goes for throughout the squad, doesn't it? You've got the players on the bench and obviously you look at the strikers who, who will come on and impact the game as, as McGoldrick and Moussa have done fantastically on Saturday but also you've got all the other players in this squad you know Bogle's come in isn't he at right back and and he'll want to make an impact and he'll want to bet in the side Norrington Davis started at the left back but Ender Stevens back and he wants mm. to stay in the side so all around the squad now you've got serious competition for places I think the only one injured may, may be uh, Berg, Berger mm. at the moment mm. so you know but you've, we've got him to come back yeah as well, as well. I mean, two really well worked goals here by the way that we're looking at you know the equaliser and the the goal that turned out to be the winner from McGoldrick. You know, really well worked, good measured balls in, weren't they, Carl? They're great passing ma ma manoeuvres, you know, and the work rate, the, the way the ball was won back, mm. where I think it contradicts what you're saying about the belief, because I think the boys believe three against three, get a another set of players in the area. I think our black boys believe they're better than any opposition and give us a little chance and we're outplay you. Um, and I, I, just, I just feel... This, these goals, these chances are all, all going the right way and we're, all, we're looking really, really good. Great to have you with us here on SUTV Live tonight. I'm joined by Kevin Gage and Carla Saba. We are building up to kick off at 7.45. It is Sheffield United against Millwall. On the subject of Didzi, as Saab so eloquently put it there, let's hear from him, shall we? He, of course, got the winning goal at the weekend. David, you've had some special moments at Bramall Lane over the years. Why does that stack up against some of had in the past? It's right up there, you know, as a, a cameo. Uh, it's great to come on and influence the game, obviously, to get my first goal of the season. You know, I've been out of the team for a bit of injuries and didn't come on last game, you know, so I've had to grit my teeth and, you know, really work hard to, to get back in. And I know I had to come on and make an impression today um, for the lads. And, um, you know, I'm, just, I'm delighted that that's happened. Talk us through the goals. Firstly, you were heavily involved in the equalizer. Yeah, um, I got played the ball by Ben and I could see the defender charging up. So I know Sharpie plays off my movement. So I flicked around the corner. He's got it and I know his quality that he played me back through. And then I seen uh, the big moose, you know, screaming in the box. So it was cross and it was a great finish and it was a great team goal. Second one, uh, Ender Stevens got it down the, the line and I know his quality. I played him for years and he's found me out. And, um, you know, I've luckily got a good connection on it. Took a deflection and, and gone in and it was a great feeling. There's a lot of bodies in the penalty area for that second goal. It looked like you just held your run just to yeah, you know, I know he's got a great left foot on him, you know, the boy, and uh, it was a great pick out, and it was a great work goal, you know, the momentum was, was going with us, and, it, you know, like I say, it was a great feeling to hit the back of the net to get the fur for the season. Had injury issues, obviously, this season. We know it was a real wrench for you to retire from international football, but that decision appears to have paid off, and so just keeping that extra time, hasn't it, to get back from injury, and get that people Yeah, you know, I think. I would have played 45 minutes if I would have still international if I would have got picked. Um, but it was great to, to have two weeks training on my belt the past couple of weeks to get my fitness up. And, you know, really just, just fight for my place here. It's a massive fight on the quality that we've got in the front line. You know, I see it's, it's good that it's been for, you know, a few years and, you know, it's still going to be a fight. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm chomping at the bit. You just can't help but like David McGoldrick, can you, both as a footballer and as a person, and the journey that he's been on, I think it makes it more special when, you know, when Chris brought him in, he was without a club, he was considering packing in his career, Chris took a gamble on him, and he's, he's repaid the club over and over and over, hasn't he, Kevin? Oh, yeah, he's had a wonderful four seasons, hasn't yeah. he, he really has. And, he, and even when he had that dry spell without goals, what was really touching from the fans, they 
got behind him every time he stepped on the pitch. And we'll, we'll get Carl's thoughts on this in a moment. But as a striker, when things aren't going for you, but the fans are still with you, that's massive, surely. Yeah, I mean, Saab's will know all about that, won't he? But we, from our point of view, from the fans' point of view, we can see what he brings to the team. And yeah. he, was, he was crucial to the way Sheffield United played under Chris Wilder. We needed that link player. You know, to, to make things tick in the middle of the field, and he drifts around, doesn't he? With his low, he glides around the pitch, which is wonderful to see. And yeah, he started to get his goals. He obviously was top scorer in the Premiership. Uh, didn't get that many. I don't think he's ever been a prolific goal scorer. But I think all the fans and certainly the players appreciate what he brings to the team as well. He's kind of a player's player, and I'm sure they appreciate just how and know just how good he is. Carl, bet you're a big fan, aren't you? Massive fan. He's, he's had a great career. Um, his technique is great. He, he's, he does the unpredictable uh, and he does it silky. He's not an erratic yeah. player. But what's, what's been good for me is I've been saying the manager needs a striker. He's looking for a striker and we had Brewster and they weren't, he wasn't coming on. But Bernie wasn't coming on. The manager sees the strikers every day in training. Didzy came back straight away from his injury. He was back in the squad got on the pitch ahead of the other strikers so that's testament to how how good he is that the manager appreciates it um, and his, his goals and his the way he's infectious on the pitch it, it's brilliant and the fans here well, you know you was talking about a dry spell and him not scoring the fans here respect hard work and team ethic so it's not all about scoring goals as a striker it's great if you're Billy Sharp and you score one in two and you but if you're not you've still got something to offer the club and the fans respect you and and did he's got goals if he hasn't got goals he's got team ethic and the fans love him and, and rightly so yeah he's a top pro and Slavisha Jokanovic starts him tonight speaking of whom let's hear from the manager who after successive defeats before the international break was thrilled to get back to winning ways at the weekend it's some performance and some way how we win the game would then encourage us a lot and uh, it's a good win for our uh, confidence is uh, is good win for uh, for our uh, players uh, trust in the in the in the process and uh, at the end is uh, right now it's uh, is behind of us and we are focusing for next step is it even more pleasing to win it with two very well crafted goals his football games is uh, 90 few few minutes. Uh, at the end of the day, it's uh, most important than everything is how it's you are finished the the game. But uh, I can be satisfied how we play the game. I have uh, be satisfied how we created the the the, 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 the chances. Uh, we are dominated the, the the one really good squad, a really good football team like uh, like Stoke. Uh, Reaction was good. Uh, collaboration for the for the bench was uh, good too. It's people who started the the, the, the game was focused and concentrated. It's a lot of the positive things, but of course, like uh, like uh, like all the games where you make it some kind of analysis, uh, you believe we can uh, we can still uh, instill uh, highest level. That's Slavisha Jukanovic. The Blades up against Millwall tonight. I think we all pretty much know what Millwall are likely to do and without sounding disrespectful to them they are an established championship team who will come here to make life very difficult they'll use their height to their advantage but let's not forget they've got a sprinkling of quality in there and by quality i mean jed wallace carlos saba who literally everything seems to flow through yeah. him he's been involved in eight of their 11 goals so far four yeah. goals four assists he's he's a top top yeah. player he, and somebody who they have to be wary of tonight. yeah he's a key player and he has a great influence um uh, and of course we've got to be aware but i think our strength in that is to to make him chase us to make him be working against us but millwall they're a solid team they, they don't give anything away uh, and we're going to have to beat them. What they're going to be looking for are our mistakes. They're going to be trying to turn the atmosphere to slow the game down and play to their strengths of set pieces and, and direct football. We've got to be bigger than that. And I, I think, you know, we, we know we've got to outplay teams and that's what we're set up to do. So it's going to be an exciting match. Mm. Kevin, when you look at Millwall's results, barring the, the odd exception, they're always very tight games, aren't they? You look at their, their games this season, they're very, very tight. Yeah, as, as Carl said, they, they're, they're, they're workmanlike, I think is the word, isn't it? They, they are Millwall. Um, no one likes them, they don't care, as the song goes. 
Um, yeah, they're always tough to beat. You know what you're getting from them. No airs or graces. I think it comes with a territory down there, doesn't it? Um, I think they drew something like six on the row or something, something like yeah, that. Yeah, they so, do draw a lot. Yeah, of they'll, games. they'll come here. They'll be tough to break down. You know, they'll battle, which we expect from most championship seat, uh, sides, to be honest. And it's just up to us to impose our game on Millwall, which I kind of say every week now. But it's true. We're set up to to do what we're good at, which mm. is keeping the ball and, and creating and finding those gaps and getting on the end of things. Nothing yeah, they'll, really changes. They'll be keen to provide a reaction tonight, Millwall, after being beaten at home by Luton at the weekend. As regards as to United's last league win over Millwall, that came at the den. I think it was at this game just over three years ago. And David McGoldrick, who we've mentioned before, played a, a crucial role in this match as well. He got a, a couple of goals. Billy Sharp got the first. But it was a bit of a thriller, this one, actually. I don't know whether you guys remember this game or not, but um, it was a bit of a topsy-turvy game at times. Five goals in it. United running out 3-2 winners in the end. But again, another example of what Millwall all about, getting a goal off a set piece there um, and causing problems. You know, they've shown that they're more than just a, a set piece team. If you're not careful, they can give you, I think that's Lee Gregory, isn't it? Is mm. it Lee Gregory? Possibly. Oh. Don't know. But um, McGoldrick showing his call here. That wouldn't have been given Saturday, that. <laughs> <laughs> not wow. with that referee, no. Jesus. No. But uh, McGoldrick, the only man for the job, really. Yeah, Stuck that, his penalty yeah. away really well. We're assuming yeah. Billy Sharp wasn't on the pitch then, maybe. No, he was. He was, was, he was yeah. So he's, yeah, he's took the penalty as he, from Billy. Yeah, mm. yeah. Pulled rank on that occasion. And uh, that wasn't his final involvement either. Look at this. But look at that play. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a typical Sheffield yeah. United goal of the time. You know, a little give and go around the edge of the box and a low cross. Yeah, indeed. And we've had to uh, <laughs> dig deep. But you're not going to believe this, Kevin Gage. We have found one of your goals against Millwall here at Bramall Lane. Yeah, what I'm do you remember of this? I, I actually remember it very well. To it's be in colour as well. I can't believe it. It's in colour. Straight from the free kick. There you go. Deceived the keeper with the ice. He thought I was going over the wall and just slotted it in the corner. We've taken the Pathé News commentary off that. No, I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. It's not that long ago. But we were reminiscing earlier on about some of the players on that pitch. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Andre. Uh, Jostein Flo. Paul Rogers, Glyn Hodges. Do you remember some of the other names that played that? Uh, yeah, Phil Starbuck, Phil uh, Starbuck. Charlie Hartfield, yeah. there was wow. a Mitch Ward. You know, the, we had a, we weren't we weren't a fabulous side. We were, we were a bit disappointing in that season. I think we only something finished eighth or something like that. We flirted with the top six, but we just got relegated out of the uh, the Premier League, of course, the season before. So I think we we were in a bit of the doldrums as well, similar to what we experienced the first few weeks of this season. Actually, lots of parallels there. Who was player of the season that season? Oh, that would be me. I think. Wow. Really thinking back. I can't yeah. believe yeah. you didn't mention that right at the start. I'm, I'm modest, really. <laughs> he is. He's very, very, very modest. Uh, back to the here and now. A reminder of the team news here at Bramall Lane. Uh, a couple of changes for Sheffield United tonight. Uh, Connor Howrahan mm -hmm. comes into the starting eleven, as does David McGoldrick as well. System we expect to be the same, right? It's just like yeah. for like, isn't it, position-wise, yeah. fellas? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd be interested to see Connor Hurahan with a full game. I don't think uh, Norwood's been actually bad. I think he's a bit harsh on Norwood, but I do understand why he's made that change. We've got, got to give Hurahan a game. Um, Bogle re retains his place, whether Bulldock, uh, Bulldock is, is fit or not. Maybe not quite 100% fit, but you know, I'm a big fan of Bogle, and I think in this setup, in this team, he can produce an awful lot for us. And I would be screaming at Bulldog, if, uh, of Bogle, sorry, if I was his manager, to just keep taking the defenders on and getting to that byline and whipping those crosses, whipping those crosses in, because he is so good going forward. We're going to hear more from Jaden Bogle in just a moment. Can we have a peek at Millwall? Have we got that available to have a look at? There we are. Um, I think it's pretty clear what their strengths are. Very big and strong at the back. Jake Cooper, in particular, will be a threat on free kicks and corners, things like that. We've mentioned Jed Wallace already, and you'll recognise one name in that starting eleven, of course, in Ryan Leonard, who played here, didn't have the best of times, in fairness, but um, he'll be keen, no doubt, to perhaps show Sheffield United fans what they're missing, won't he, Carl? Yeah, of course. He, he'll be looking just to, to get a good performance under his belt. I don't think he'll be trying to prove anybody wrong or anything. He's just got a big match, and this is a, it's a great setting, you know, playing away at Sheffield United under lights, They'll be up for it. They're not going to give us anything. So um, 
it's it's going to be good. I hope we, we don't give them anything to, to get their teeth in to start off with. Just show them that it's going to be a hard night. Well, I mentioned Jaden Bogle. Let's hear from him now. He made his first league start at the weekend and he knew the importance of that win against Stoke to get Sheffield United moving in the right direction. It's a, it's a tough league um, and it's a very long season, obviously. You don't want to be looking at the table too much at the moment, but ultimately that's that's a, a big part of, of the championship, the league table. So we, we know we're now positioning it and we know what we need to do to get where we want to be. So it's just about keep doing that throughout the season. On a personal level, how have you found the season so far? How much are you enjoying playing at the moment? Yeah, um, beginning of the season was frustrating for me. Um, I didn't really get much of an opportunity, but obviously I've, I've had... Um, a few opportunities recently so so I'm grateful for that and for me it's just about focusing on on what I do when I get on the pitch and ultimately it's, it's the manager's decision at the end of the day on the team that he, that he wants to pick and as I said before we've got a big squad and everyone's going to play their part so no matter which which team gets selected if I'm playing if I'm not playing I, I just want the best for the team. How difficult is that for a player you know having to, to wait having to be patient because you have had to be patient haven't you during your time at Sheffield United? Yeah definitely um but you sort of you sort of know that, especially when coming to a new team, that you need to be patient and wait for your opportunities. So, <clears throat> so yeah, I knew I knew that I'd have to be patient and wait for my chance, and just hopefully I can I can keep taking my chance when when they come my way. And what do you expect in this next game? What kind of game do you do you anticipate? Um, they'll be physical. It'll be a tough game, but I think again it's just down to us on what we do. If we're defensively strong, um, we know we're going to create chances going forward, and, and hopefully we can score. That's Jaden Bogle. Time now for our exclusive interview with Lise Mousset, who climbed off the bench to spark the comeback against Stoke at the weekend. He himself thrilled to be back on the pitch after a frustrating time with injuries. And it was the comeback as well for the 1 1, so it was a good moment for me at the front of the, the crowd. First goal on this, this side of the pitch as well, so it was a good moment. It's been a long way, hasn't it, to get fans back in the stadium. So just how good it good was it to score and hear the full cup roar when that ball went in the net? Yeah, it's been a long time. It's been like one year, I think. It's been a long time since since the COVID. It's been very difficult for us without the fans. So it's good to, to have them back. Tell us about the feeling inside when you score, because it's been a long way for you as well. It's been a tough time, hasn't it, with injuries. So getting that goal... It must have been a big feeling for you. Yeah, it's, it's a good feeling because when you get injured, I get injured two times, it was not good. Then I had the bad time as well when I come back on the pitch. I was no very good in myself. I don't put my... That's Lise Mousset. Um Carlos Saba, how do United get the best out of him? What's the secret? Because he's, he's undoubtedly a talent. We know he's got quality, but how do they get the best out of him on a frequent basis? Well, I think the, the starting is just to try and keep him fit. Um, he's an incredible talent. He's just, he's just suffered so badly with injuries. You're watching Saturday and everyone's wincing as he's doing these long sprints because you're worried he's going to break down with a hamstring. But just keeping him on the pitch, he, he's another level, you know, he's exciting to watch. When the ball goes to him, you're not surprised, he's, he's creating so many chances. And that in itself makes room for the other strikers because the, the other team is so concerned with Mousset that frees up space. So just keeping him fit, obviously they've got a big decision coming up soon as well because he's got an option on his contract and they've got to have an insight into whether he's going to be able to stay fit and be part of the team because if he can, you know, he's one of the best players in the club. Now, in tonight's match day programme, which is a bargain at £3.50, you will see a feature with Ian Benjamin, who is Sheffield United's first modern day black player, and it's to celebrate Black History Month. And I'm delighted to welcome Mark McCammon, who, like Carl, once had a spell at Millwall, but not together. Is that right? You, no, you just together. missed each other, I think. Yeah. Didn't you? <laughs> you Welcome come, along to the studio. I love personally come after, afterwards. <laughs> so yeah, it was a good time. Was good, good, time. good to have you with us. And yeah, I'm going to shout a little bit because you just told us you got a bit of an ear infection. Yeah, There's a lot yeah. of stuff going around at the moment. But yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Delighted to have you here. Yeah. First of all, why is it important that we celebrate something like Black History Month? In your view, it's important, but it, I also think it's important that. Uh, 
people in the public domain, people out there understand the um, relevance of black history and the meaning behind it. And this comes down with education. So I think people need to get a bit more educated about it in terms of how it first happened, how it's got, it, how it's got to the stage where it is. And, you know, it's not just about slavery and also, um, you know, moving forward and etc. How we can sit together and unite and do this together and move forward and progress. It's all about progression and eradicating it as much as possible. Who did you look up to? Who were the black players that you really looked towards when you were making your way in the game? Well, when I was young, um, there was a handful of black players at that time. So was, I had to pick and choose off my proper count of my fingers. Yeah. John Barnes, Mark Waters at Liverpool. So there's probably only two at that time. So John Barnes was an absolute role model to me. And uh, when I was at Charlton Athletic as well, I had the privilege to play with such a player. You know, I just couldn't believe it. Um, it was just unbelievable seeing John Barnes playing with him. So I just looked up to him and I just wanted to get all the positives from it. Like, you know, just what can I, how can I learn from him? How can I do better? How can I become the person and strong character that he was as well? What issues did you face? What issues did I face yeah. in terms of... In terms of, of racism? Like in, term, in football related or outside in the public? Football domain. related first. Football related first. So um, I had a traumatising time at Gillingham Football Club. Really? Yeah, traumatising time. That's a long story, so I'll give you just brief bits of what happened. You know, just being treated differently to other players, and I got sat on barely. But by fellow players or supporters? Fellow or? players, fellow, fellow footballers that I was training with. So, like, you know, for example, I got fined a week's wages when I was snowed in, and we had evidence that I was snowed in, mm -hmm. and uh, the white players that were snowed in in the other side of Kent they didn't get fined. They fined all the three black players and that come up in the court. The judgment's out there. Um, it's on the government website. So if anyone wants to see that, it's on the government website. And uh, yeah, they can um, go a bit more in depth if they want to see the judgment. But it was very, very damning. Mm, I can imagine. Carl, did you ever come up against issues like that when, when oh. you were making your way? Yeah, not, not so much when I, when I started. I, there was a big incident when I was um, playing against Reading. Um, and uh, the defender John Mackey was, was banned or, or suspended from football um, and it's just it's one of those things that as myself it was I, I, I get called a lot my mum calls me names but the way the fact that someone was call, calling me a racial name was it could be my son it could mm. be my brother and it was more you just want it to stop to protect others, you know, uh, and it wasn't needed. So it's been out there. There's been a lot done um, to, to eradicate it. And there's a lot of people trying their hardest. But as Mark says, it's, it's down to education and, and people yeah. wanting change. This discussion happens a lot, doesn't it? And education, you mentioned it there, is a key word in it all. Are we making progress, though? Because to go back to the summer, you know, England, we knew when those lads stepped forward, when they missed those penalties, we all knew, didn't we, yeah. the kind of reaction that was going to get. Yeah. And we were proved right. Yeah. So are we, Mark, making the right steps forward? Because I would say not. I don't think we we're making any steps whatsoever. Um, I'm very, very disappointed with how the authorities have handled this situation. And, uh, yeah, just... Um, I think I did an interview back in 2012 for ITB, and uh, I was talking about taking action action speak louder than words mm -hmm. and to do something about it like for um the authorities to take a stand and st stance and get one together and sort it out but it hasn't got anywhere we're having the same conversation from 2012 to now i'm, I'm sitting here i got totally disheartened of it i just started you know there's nothing we can do about it i'm not wasting my energies on it anymore i went to a lot of seminars and uh a lot of briefings and all that stuff to talk about it on television, but it's just still the same. Nothing's happened. Such which is, a shame. Which obviously is a, is a crying shame. And John Barnes, as you mentioned earlier on, I've seen him do countless TV interviews, and he said, "Look, this is not just a football problem. Problem. This is a societal problem, isn't it? This is not just in in the game that we love. It's mm -hmm. out there every day. Yeah. What can we do?" I, I honestly don't know. There's a lot of cleverer people paid a lot of money to to come up with ways, and so far they haven't. So silly old me, I I'm, I'm not going to crack it myself. I just if we can reach the, the kids younger, and I think society 
is changing. I think there are, there are more, you know, it's, it's less uh, a world of colour. It's just trying to let the, the older influences just be gone. You know, for everyone to condemn it, make these people the minority and, and really make them feel out of place. Don't just give them a slap on the wrist. If they want to be racial, get them out of the game. Yeah. Get them out of this sport, get them out of that sport. So there's no room for them in society and it will soon stop. Mm. Not that card, though, you think in the society that, you know, there can be a lot more done, like in terms of, you know, just think in society we need to sort of like get a bit more together now and all we're, all we're asking for is just equality. We want to be treated equally and as fairly as everyone else. Yeah. That's all, that's all it is. Like, it's and nothing that's, more, that's, nothing, that's nothing interesting more, nothing that you bring, It's interesting that you bring that up because John Amici, who you'll know, former basketball player, he's very, very vocal on this. Mm. And he speaks a lot about white privilege. Now, white mm. privilege can be misconstrued, can't it? Because yeah. white privilege suggests that people like me have the best of everything. Yeah. And that's not the point that he's trying to make. Yeah. You... you you're aware of this yeah. white privilege term. Yeah, white privilege, just, yeah. Just, just give us your take on what that means. What white privilege? In terms of um, the way they look down on black people sort yeah. of thing. Uh, it's hard to explain. You have to be in a position, like, when you're in a position, it's sort of, like, they don't see black... I've, my, my perception of it is, like, they don't see black people as intelligent. So they look down on us. It's sort of, oh, like even when you're on the football pitch, I got known for just heading the ball, kicking the ball, good first touch. But when you see like someone like a Co um, Angolo Kante or someone like that playing, oh, he's quick, he's strong and athletic, but he's excellent on the ball. Yeah. But when it's someone like a Frank Lampard or Steven Gerrard, oh, he's absolute class. He's um, got the greatest first touch I've ever seen. Oh, what skill that is, you know, I just think there's sort of like um, that in the back of the head, so I just, I just don't understand it. It's hard to put it across to you, like, um, from what I've experienced, like, I don't know, it's just hard to explain. It's hard to explain. I know where you're coming from, because like, I, I, I've been on seminars with Leroy Rossini talking about this yeah. as well, and, and something you said there, and without going too deep, we did a whole session on football commentators and unconscious bias, and it really opened my eyes, and what you said there about it's very easy to fall into the trap of seeing a black player and automatically assuming he's quick and he's strong and he's physical. When actually, if you were describing a white player with similar attributes, you might do it in a different way. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. And, and I never thought and, about and it like that. And intelligent football brain. Exactly. So, yeah, we don't get that. And I've seen it throughout my career and uh, it's very hurtful. But, you know, my father was said to me as a kid always, you have to be twice as good as a white person to succeed in life and ever since his day he's been absolutely spot on and I just don't know why, why, why it is like that um, you know we've got all companies like big tech Facebook um, Twitter everything not doing the algorithms and you know trying to minimise this is, do, they, do they actually want us in this position mm. that's what I question I, I just ended up questioning everything over the last few months or so and um, just looking into it into depth and you know, looking at how we got here, how we got in this position, how did slavery actually stop, you know, all of these things and uh, just moving forward from there is just, I don't think it'll ever stop. I just think it might make a slow progress here and there, but I don't think it will ever get to where we want it to get to. Well, hopefully initiatives like Black History Month, and the more we keep, keep talking, yeah. we can at mm. some point make a difference and make positive steps. Louder than words. Absolutely, actions absolutely. Louder. Yeah, yeah, so actions. To bring it back to tonight, great to have you yeah. here with us. You're here to watch United against one of your old clubs, Millwall. Carl, you were with yeah. Millwall as well. What are you expecting tonight? Out on well, the um, Millwall, they've been picking up a few draws of late. and Just a few? Yeah, and, uh, and uh, Sheffield United have picked up some form. So I'm going to go for a 2-0 Sheffield United win today. I didn't even ask you for a prediction, straight in. No, no <laughs> mucking around, no mucking around. You're, you're a Sheffield resident these days, I'm are you? I'm a Sheffield resident, yeah, and I'm enjoying it thoroughly up here. Um, it's yeah. a different environment, different lifestyle. Bit so, of personal training you're doing, are yeah, you, these days? Yeah, personal training, yeah, going really well with it and um, just enjoying life and just uh, yeah, making the most of everything. Well, good to see you smiling. Last time I saw you play football, you were playing for Doncaster Rovers and being a right old handful for yeah. opposition defences. I reckon <laughs> you could still do the same even now. Yeah. You're yeah, in good shape, my friend. Yeah. Thanks for your company tonight. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for joining much. us. Carl, Mark's done his prediction. What's yours then? 3-1. 3-1.
Three one three four one. one. Yeah, I feel three one or four or four one. Well, I'm which one is it? Three one or four one? Come on, we want. I'm up Colours to the mast here. Either, either. I want either. three or four one. I feel we're creating. You saw all the chances. If we take them tonight, it should be it should be straightforward, convincing. Change the team after sixty minutes and rest them for Barnsley. Good stuff. <laughs> well, you'll rejoin me at half time, and we'll pick out all the best bits from the first half and maybe some of the bad bits. Hopefully, the good bits outweigh the bad bits. A reminder of the Sheffield United team used two changes tonight. Harahan is in. McGoldrick is in. And the crowd are ready. I can hear the, uh, the noise getting louder and louder out there, so the teams can't be too far away. Myself and Carl will be back at half time to uh, take you through all of the half time analysis. But I think it's high time we handed you over to tonight's commentary team. It is, of course, Kevin Gage and Matt Young. <laughs>